This week, I want to talk about one of the biggest icks I have on the internet, which is the constant use of a term that is completely made up and also never correctly applied. Yeah, late capitalism is just short for late stage capitalism. So basically the idea is this. Capitalism is a flawed system because it allows the people who own the means of production, right, like the businesses and the buildings, to exploit everybody else in society. By Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Base Politics. Welcome back to my show, Hannah Explains It All, where every week I help you understand what's going on in public policy, econ, and how you can be more empowered to take an active role in your government. That term is late stage capitalism. If you spend any time on platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, really any new media platform, you're going to hear an array of people using this term as a scapegoat for every issue under the sun you could imagine. What what exactly is late stage capitalism, you might ask? And that's a very good question because, again, this is a made up term. No economist is using it. Capitalism is simply a system where people have the freedom to buy and sell and trade with other people without a lot of government intervention. The more you have government getting in the way of those transactional decisions, the less capitalism you have. But for too many people who've been educated by our government indoctrination public school system, they are under the perception that capitalism is some kind of a living breed breathing entity out to get them. I'm going to show you a few videos explaining what I mean by this, and you're going to see that people are using this term to blame things that are not capitalism and that are actually the result of bad government policies or that are not really all that bad of things to begin with. First and foremost, late stage capitalism is advertising. <laughs> Personally, I can't imagine looking at a world where people are being bombed, children are starving, there's abject poverty, and thinking that Starbucks advertising on the side of my subway train is some kind of a hellscape. Now, I understand that a lot of the online activists, and I call them this because they aren't actually contributing to public policy whatsoever. They probably don't even know how to look up their lawmaker and call them, but they do a lot of posting on Instagram and TikTok to make you think they're very engaged in public matters. And that class of people is very upset about what's happening in Gaza. So am I, by the way. But what are they doing about it? Are they calling their lawmakers? Are they actually protesting outside their offices? Are they donating to relief efforts? No, they're boycotting Starbucks and they really think they're doing something here because they believe Starbucks supports Israel and therefore by boycotting them, they're going to stop Israel from carrying out its campaign in Gaza. It makes sense if you're completely illiterate when it comes to how public policy works, I guess. Now, one thing I like to do when I see insane videos like this on TikTok is look at the comments and see if I am the only one who does not have broken brain syndrome. And sometimes I'll be pleasantly surprised to see comments actually pushing back against these kinds of ridiculous videos. But that was not the case with this one. It appeared that the vast majority of TikTok that saw this video was in lockstep with this girl. One commenter said, everyone is missing the point. It's the sheer amount that we are advertised to constantly. We have become numb and compliant. I don't really know how to explain to you that being advertised to is not a form of being oppressed. It is simply being presented with options that you have every capability of passing up. If this is your biggest problem in life, I know you live in a capitalist country because you are so extremely privileged as to think there is a problem here that deserves outcry on the internet. One of the things I've also noticed about people who grow up in capitalist countries is that they not only believe they're being oppressed by things like advertising or having a lot of options, they also tend to be pretty pissed when things are very cheap or easy to obtain. I'm dead serious. This commenter said, they have deals every day too. Like the audacity of Starbucks offering you cheap deals on coffee and donuts. You only have the ability to complain about access to cheap, easy food because you live under capitalism. Meanwhile, people in Gaza right now that you claim to care so much about, they're mixing up dog food with hay to stay alive and feeding that to their babies. Get a grip. Next up on our list of things late stage capitalism is supposedly responsible for, we have having to work a job to survive. Five fun tips for dealing with late stage capitalism as a depressed young person. I like to count my work days like an optimistic prisoner. Only two more sleeps till I'm free. Whenever I get stressed thinking about all the tasks I need to do in order to simply survive, I like to not do them. Hope this helps. I like to think about how the aliens are gonna show up and threaten to overthrow our leaders, and we're gonna try to help them. I like to pretend everything is like a fun cookout this summer, except the earth is a grill and we are the meat. One thing I did recently is deleted the weather app for my mental health. I like to consider all the biodegradable things in my life. Uh, me, for example, I break down very easily. 
If any of these resonate with you, chances are you're gonna like our music. We're called Negative 25. So further the capitalistic wheel and check us out on Spotify. If any of our bitching about capitalism resonated with you, buy our album because we definitely hate capitalism. The jokes write themselves around here. I have a feeling these guys' music is every bit as off-tune as their ridiculous messaging here. It's not because of capitalism that you have to work a job to survive. And what's interesting is that this one character says he doesn't do things he needs to survive. And that's because capitalism has made you so wealthy that you can kind of get away with being a bum. I've said it many times before, and I'll continue to say it. I don't know where these people get the notion that under different economic systems, they wouldn't have to work to survive. Somebody has to gather your food. Somebody has to become educated enough to provide you health care. Somebody has to develop the equipment they use to provide you with health care. Somebody has to build your house. And back before capitalism, you either had to be the one to do the vast majority of those things for yourself, or you lived in some kind of feudal system where you had an overlord or you were in slavery. Under communism, you continue to have to work. You just don't get to pick the kinds of jobs you're going to do. But for some reason, all these jackasses that still believe in communism genuinely seem to believe that if they were to move to the system, they would be appointed the neighborhood poet while everybody else would have to wait on them like slaves. And this is my biggest problem with those ideologies. They are based on greed and they're also based on your innate desire to make other people serve you. Because if you're not planning to do those tasks, somebody else has to do them. And if you don't think they deserve to get paid to do them, that makes you a really bad person. Furthermore, the fact that they try to insinuate the environment or issues with the weather are somehow the result of capitalism is completely uneducated. Newsflash, the worst countries in the world when it comes to the environment are communist countries like China. It is actually only thanks to the wealth that capitalism creates that people have time to give a crap about the environment. Before we had that kind of wealth potential, people were too busy trying to figure out how to survive as they are in most third world countries and in countries that do not live under capitalism right now. When you don't have the excess money you have that's created under capitalism, you don't have the excess means or time to divert attention to these kinds of initiatives. And that's why we actually see capitalist countries on the leading forefront of truly dealing with environmental issues. The next thing late stage capitalism has allegedly done is ruined malls. I promise you, I went to this mall on a weekday and in the early afternoon, it was about 1230. Every store was closed except for what a pizza place in Target. Target doesn't even count. Oh, wait, the movie theater as well. Y'all, this is late stage capitalism. This is late stage capitalism. Before we know it, we're not going to have malls any anymore. There's not going to be anyone left to work in these malls. No one wants to work for nine, ten hours a day making eleven hours and eleven dollars an hour, twelve dollars an hour, thirteen dollars an hour. No, not even for fifteen dollars an hour, not even for sixteen dollars an hour. The people need more. F this. Goodbye malls. <laughs> If you're confused, you're not the only one. I can't keep up. Is consumerism very, very bad and it's horrible that you're being advertised to and corporations are terrible or we're upset that corporations no longer have malls where they can market to you 24-7 and people go and spend the vast majority of their time to buy a lot of stuff. Like there is zero consistency from this crowd whatsoever. Secondarily, malls dying out is not some sort of big massive problem. It's, it's actually indicative of the fact that it has become easier to find things that you want, to find better prices on them, and to get them sent to your house, meaning you have more time to do everything else under the sun you need or want to do. Back in the day when I was a kid, you had to spend a pretty substantial amount of time at malls. I remember it vividly because I hated shopping even as a kid. You had to spend hours and hours combing through various stores, looking for things that fit you, styles that you liked, good deals. And yes, all those companies that had to pay people to man those stores to ensure you weren't shoplifting, to re-rack things, to check you out. The fact that so much of our retail has moved online means that jobs have gotten better while consumers are also getting a better service. That's a good thing that capitalism created. Apparently, late stage capitalism is leisurely waking up before you go eat breakfast and then go to a job that definitely isn't manual labor.
the horror of her day. She is clearly enslaved by capitalism. I don't I don't know how you become this delusional. I really don't. Like this is so off in the clouds. It's it's absurd. It ought to be in the DSM. I also think it's ridiculous how these Pillsbury Doe children think that they are struggling and oppressed here while they're working these office jobs. Meanwhile, people are going swimming with sharks just for the opportunity to come to a capitalist country and do manual labor that these people think they're too good for. And that's just so that they can get the chance to live under capitalism. One of these groups is operating from a point of rationality and the other is simply not. Now, anytime I'm criticizing everyday twats on my show, I do have to recognize that these people online are not intellectual heavyweights. They're not ideologues. They're not intellectual thought leaders. They're really just people who mostly hate their lives and are looking for a scapegoat. And because somebody once told them that the problems they're facing are, are the result of capitalism, they're running with it. And also because they just want engagement bait and they realize that bashing capitalism gets you a lot of views probably. I think it's fine to acknowledge real problems that people are dealing with here in the United States while also helping them understand what truly created those problems. I'm not saying that there are absolutely no real problems people in America face. Obviously, there are, especially in the past couple of years as the government has continued to wreck our economy and make the cost of living go through the roof. But I think we can be sympathetic to people's problems while also making sure they understand that they do still have it better than the vast majority of the rest of the world here in America. And while also not letting them get away with scapegoating the wrong things for the problems that they see. When we talk about actual issues like the cost of health care, the cost of housing or daycare, we need people to actually understand the policies that created those problems so they can meaningfully take action. Instead, what we see with these people is that they're blaming capitalism, which is actually responsible for all the good in their lives. But there are others online in these spaces talking about these issues that are hardcore communist. They are looking to sow seeds of dissatisfaction, and they want to use those seeds of dissatisfaction to undermine our institutions, our constitution, and individual liberty. And the truth of the matter is, they don't have that hard of a time convincing people to blame capitalism or create a boogeyman out of it. And that's because our public schools are failing so vastly to give Americans even a baseline understanding of economics, particularly when it comes to capitalism. Because of this lack of an education, they think that everything that happens in the United States is capitalism. They think the government is capitalism. They think anything the government does is capitalism. I personally think this is intentional. And I made an entire video on my original series based detailing what capitalism actually is a number of years ago to address this problem. For the record, a government is not capitalist. And that's because capitalism is an economic system. An economy can be capitalist or not capitalist. A government can be structured to either empower a free market economy or it can be structured to be highly interventionist into it. The degree to which that occurs is the degree to which a country is capitalist or socialist or communist or mixed. Now, while I would still consider the United States predominantly a capitalist country, it's important to know that over the past hundred years, thanks to various government policies intervening in the market, that has become increasingly less and less so. And those interventions are directly responsible responsible for the vast majority of the issues we are facing today. Meanwhile, sectors of the U.S. economy that have been left alone from these kinds of government policies tend to be doing better. They're innovating faster, the prices are falling, and that's in direct contrast to industries like healthcare, which is completely overrun with government, where we see the prices going through the roof, the quality of care going down, and innovation beginning to stagnate. Interestingly enough, many of the things I see people blame late-stage capitalism for are the sectors and industries where the government has gotten very involved and or they are reproducing percussions from government interventions into the market that they are blaming capitalism for instead. So with that being said, I want to turn your attention to some of the more substantial issues people are currently blaming late stage capitalism for that actually have a lot more to do with government. And to do that, I want to introduce you to a TikToker. Her name is Madeline Pendleton, and she's a hardcore commie. But guys, I got to be honest, I kind of like this girl. And I like her because I think if I sat down and had a conversation with her, I could almost get her to a pretty similar point of view of mine. Number one, she's extremely financially smart. She runs her own business in California and she runs it as a socialist co-op. Everybody in her company makes the same amount of money. They all take dividends out of the proceeds. She seems to be a very generous employer. And I have no issue with any of this. Under capitalism, you are perfectly free to run your business in this way. And I think she's a great example for other people who feel like businesses should be doing more for their employees. It doesn't take government force to get there. Now, that being said, the reverse would not be true under her ideal system. Under a communist or socialist country, I would not have the same freedoms to run my business as a capitalist company. And that's because capitalism innately entails individual freedom and autonomy and choices and communism and socialism employ 
force. But all that being said, Madeline seems to be a very well-intended person, even though I think her utopia is quite flawed. And honestly, I might try to have her on the platform at some point to have a good natured debate because I do think she's an interesting person. But without further ado, let's roll a recent video she made discussing late stage capitalism and why I think she's wrong. Yeah, late capitalism is just short for late stage capitalism. So basically the idea is this. Capitalism is a flawed system because it allows the people who own the means of production, right, like the businesses and the buildings to exploit everybody else in society. All right, so we'll stop there and address her first point because she's going to make a few, but she says that capitalism is about exploiting people. I think it's important to be very precise with our language, so I want to look up the definition of exploit. As dictionary.com says, exploit means to make full use of and derive benefit from a resource. So that's not really a bad thing. That means you're using all of your resources in a wise manner. You're getting the most out of something. It doesn't mean you're pressing somebody or taking advantage of them, which is the context I often hear socialists try to use it. If anything, under capitalism, that means workers are also exploiting companies and their employers. Both have to derive value from one another in order to get the long-term benefit out of the relationship. And both have to help create value to consumers in order to get that benefit. This is what I actually love about capitalism. It observes human nature and it says, you know what? Humans are selfish and they are self-interested and you're not going to change that. Let's be grown-ups and acknowledge the reality in the room. But what you can do is incentivize that desire so that people have to serve one another in order to pursue their own self-interest. Under capitalism, to get what you need, to get what you want, to get ahead, you have to be of value to other people. That's a really good thing. Furthermore, at her first point here, she tries to make it sound like under capitalism, the workers don't own the means of production. But if that's true, who does? Because under her theory, socialism or communism, the government ends up owning the means of production. That is mostly not true in the United States. So who owns it if it's not the government and it's not the workers? Socialists will often try to obscure the fact that it actually is individuals that own the means of production under capitalism because they try to say that corporations control everything. And in saying this, they try to make it seem as if corporations are somehow hoarding the means of production away from others in society. But first and foremost, only 18% of U.S. companies are corporations. The vast majority of companies in the U.S. are small businesses. There are only roughly a thousand companies that have been around in the U.S. for over 100 years. So this idea that all these corporations have been in control and it's just a small group of people that have been running them for some time and these are the oligarchs of society, it is just not grounded in facts. And by the way, even when companies do become very large and become corporations, they are still owned by the people. They have a number of people who own them and operate them and they also have people who own their stocks and shares and therefore own them. So with all this in mind, I would say capitalism is actually working pretty darn good. The opportunities for people who want to work hard here and move forward are endless. So all in all, I would say if there is exploitation happening, it's for everybody's benefit, and that's not really a bad thing. I see no problems here thus far. Let's go back to Madeline's video. By stealing wages, by overcharging for housing, whatever. And these issues lead to like such extreme inequality that it would spiral out of control over time, much like we see today. Wealth inequality is on the rise, wages have stagnated, home ownership is on the decline, the ultra rich are paying less and less in taxes, Jeff Bezos apparently only paid 0.98% or something. Monopolies are on the rise. And most Americans do not have a plan for their retirement. All of these things are symptoms of what people refer to as late stage capitalism or late capitalism. This idea that the system of capitalism has allowed so much power and money to amass by the heads of the means of production, the owners of the businesses, the owners of the buildings, that their power and money continues to increase exponentially, creating monopolies, increasing prices, including on things like medication, and drive down overall nationwide worker pay, further economically stratifying the classes. Gosh, that all sounds pretty bad, if it were true, which it's mostly not. I'm going to go through this point by point and point out where she's either completely wrong or blaming capitalism for something government did. Let's begin. We'll start with her point on wage theft, which is already illegal. She's blaming capitalism for something that's really just an underbelly of human nature. Sometimes people steal. Sometimes people mistreat people. Sometimes people try to take advantage of others. That's true in any society you're in. I don't know why they think this just occurs under capitalism. Secondarily, in our capitalist system, we have already made wage theft illegal. That means if somebody is doing this to you, you have recourses you can pursue to rectify that situation. Next up, she tries to blame the housing market and housing prices on capitalism. 
This is one of their favorite issues to go after when they talk about late stage capitalism, and it is completely removed from any knowledge of the actual economic reality behind housing whatsoever. I did two whole episodes recently on this series examining why it is that housing has become so expensive, and it all has to do with the government preventing the capitalists from building more of it. It's not BlackRock buying up all the houses as I debunked last week. It's not your landlord just being greedy. It is the government preventing the market from responding to demand. I'll link those two episodes here if you want to dig further into that, but for now I'll move on. The next point she brings up pertains to wealth inequality, which I just have so many bones to pick over. Being concerned with wealth inequality is really just a function of greed. It doesn't make you a pious person. It's not because you're concerned with the poor. It's because you're mad that somebody next to you has more money. It doesn't matter if somebody around you has more money than you do. And that's because wealth is not a finite fixed pie. Somebody having a lot of money does not mean that you are blocked from making money or making as much money as they have. What matters is if you have the opportunity to meet your needs and to work hard and move up in life. And in fact, I would say the fact that there is wealth inequality in the U.S. could even be labeled a good thing. It means that there is a lot of opportunity for people to make money, to advance, to innovate, to create, to grow here. And that means we all have a better quality of life thanks to those innovations and a higher GDP. That means there's more jobs, more opportunity for you to make money without taking on the risk of starting a company yourself. It also means your social programs, which Democrats and leftists tend to really like, stay afloat. Newsflash, if you don't have people making a lot of money, therefore paying a lot of taxes, you can't afford to give people a bunch of free stuff. Now, many of these people will try to claim that the wealthy did not earn their money in the U.S. and so it's bad that they have it, which again is simply greed. It's not really your business how somebody gets their money because again, it doesn't impact your own ability to make money. But this also is just not factual. Contrary to stereotypes, the wealthy tend to earn rather than inherit their wealth and relatively few rich people work on Wall Street or in finance. Most rich people got that way by providing us with goods and services that improve our lives. I know that they hate this fact. They really do. They cannot stand the idea that most billionaires created some value for society, but it isn't escapable. As this report goes on to note, income mobility may be smaller than we would like, but people continue to move up and down the income ladder. Few fortunes survive for multiple generations, while the poor are still able to rise out of poverty. Most important, there is little relationship between inequality and poverty. The fact that some people become wealthy does not mean that others will become poor. So I don't even think that wealth inequality is a big deal, but let's say you're not convinced by that. She's still wrong about why there is growing inequality in the country. If you want to look at when income inequality began to really grow in the United States, you have to ask yourself, WTF happened in 1971. This is a website that you can check out, and I encourage you to do so because this is one of many issues that were impacted by a decision that occurred in 1971. If you're new to economic decisions, you probably don't know, but in 1971, the Federal Reserve officially severed all ties that we had with the gold standard, meaning that our money was no longer backed by anything of merit. This led to the current monetary policies we have seen over the past couple of decades that have been bankrupting this country where the government can spend a ton of money it doesn't have because it just prints new dollars that aren't worth anything. There's nothing backing them up, but there's nothing constraining them from doing that. You have more dollars floating around in society. The price of things will go up. You will have inflation. This is also how they continue to fund a ton of wars that we cannot afford. And as a whole, it's why our country has gone completely off track. For the record, capitalism would suggest that your money has to be backed by something. True capitalists would not support a fiat money system and hate the Federal Reserve, don't think it should ever have been created. So if you're mad about this or any of the other things listed on WTF happened in 1971, you need to blame the government impeding the capitalist market, not capitalism. And if you continue to rant and rave about capitalism when you're talking about issues like this, you simply look completely financially illiterate to anybody in the know. Next up, Madeline says late-stage capitalism is responsible for wages stagnating. Now, wages have stagnated, especially in recent years, thanks in large part to Bidenomics. I'd like to direct your attention to a new website called Bidenomics.com that addresses this particular issue. Now, the Biden administration is trying to claim, for the record, that wages are up after being adjusted for inflation. But in reality, working Americans are making less under Joe Biden, with inflation-adjusted hourly wages down 2%. Recent real wage increases have been more than offset by a decrease in the average work week. The result, since January 2021, real weekly earnings have shrunk 4.4%. America's paychecks are definitely lighter thanks to Biden. And by the way, thanks to Trump, too, who also had atrocious policies, including his trade policies, his stimulus spending. I'm not letting him off the hook either. But Biden definitely came in and amplified the existing problems that were there with his signature pieces of legislation like the American Rescue Plan. 
as I say all the time on this show, there is a very good chance that your beliefs are bankrupting you if you are in the same school of thought as Madeline. Because these kinds of people support a ton of government spending and government programs. But policies have consequences, and the government cannot just spend and spend and spend made-up money without you having to pick up the bill at the end of the day. Everybody suffers under inflation. It's not just the individual. It is the business owners. It is the corporations. And so taxpayers end up picking up the bag on all of this on multiple fronts. They see their wages stagnate. They have to pay higher prices when they go to purchase things. Their savings are worth less. The list goes on. Now, these are problems, and they're problems that need to be corrected. I am not in agreement with any of these decisions that have been made in recent years. But it is worth pointing out that the situation is not quite as dire as she wants you to believe. According to this report from the American Economic Institute, since 1990, real median wages grew by 34 percent. Real wages at the 10th, 20th, and 30th percentiles grew over this period by 50, 48, and 38 percent, respectively. A 39 percent increase in purchasing power is a significant increase. As this economist says, their characterization of wage growth over this period would be solid, but not spectacular. And listen, we should want spectacular. We could get it under a truly capitalist economy. And that's why I agree with this economist who says policymakers should focus on policies to boost productivity, which would quicken the pace of wage growth along with measures to increase competition in the labor market. In other words, if you want wages to go up faster, try more capitalism. Next up, Madeline says one of the most tired talking points I think we hear from socialists across the world, which is that the rich don't pay taxes or that they pay less than you in taxes. The reality is the top 1% of taxpayers, those who earn $561,351 or more, paid 42.3% of the total tax revenue collected in 2020, according to the latest figures from the IRS. In fact, the top 1% of taxpayers paid more income taxes than the bottom 90% altogether. It is infuriating to me when people say that the rich don't pay taxes. The rich pay the vast majority of taxes in this country. Is it as large of a percentage of their income as perhaps you end up paying? Maybe, maybe not. But that's largely because the rich tend to own businesses and therefore can access a lot of loopholes that you simply cannot when you're working a W-2. Working a W-2 is probably the crappiest tax structure you can be under. You do get screwed, but you also have a much cushier life. You're not having to take on risk. You're not having to put up your own investments. There are trade-offs involved no matter which way you go. Because opening a business does incur risk and because opening a business is so essential for our economy, it's what ultimately boosts our GDP and creates jobs, the government does want to incentivize that. So yes, they get a better tax code. You can access that too if you want to start a business. But this whole the rich pay no taxes line is horseshit. And if you think it's unfair that different people have different payment structures with which they pay their taxes, then you can join libertarians in arguing for a flat tax system. Libertarians, by the way, are the most capitalist entity in the entire United States, and they have been at the forefront of this issue since before I've been alive. Next up, Madeline claims Jeff Bezos paid only 0.98% in taxes, and this is because of late-stage capitalism. A tax structure is created by a government, not a capitalist economy. So even if you are mad about this, this isn't capitalism's fault. It would be the government's fault, which people like Madeline and other communists want to give total control to. Make it make sense. Furthermore, this statistic is uber manipulative. Here's how they get it. ProPublica's report showed that between 2014 and 2018, Bezos paid $972 million in total taxes on $4.22 billion of income. Meanwhile, his wealth grew by $99 billion, meaning the true tax rate was only 0.98% during this period. They are counting on you being economically illiterate for this to bother you. Because his wealth does not mean money he actually has in the bank. His wealth is based on what people assume his assets are worth, many of them unrealized assets. Suggesting that somebody should have to pay taxes on money they have actually not received yet is insanity. Secondarily, there is a huge difference in what an individual pays in taxes and what their companies might pay in taxes. Amazon has received a ton of criticism over the years for its very low tax rate it often receives. But again, this isn't really Jeff Bezos' fault. He's just taking advantage of the system he's been dealt. And the system he's been dealt is one where the government is increasingly getting involved in the market and manipulating it through things like corporate welfare and selective tax breaks, both of which are not capitalism. Neither are bailouts, by the way. Anytime you see the government coming in and picking winners and losers in the business world, that's a violation of capitalist principles. If you're mad about that, join capitalists in trying to oppose it and shut down corporate welfare deals that occur across all states and localities. They are corrupt. They shouldn't be happening. But they aren't happening because of late-stage capitalism. They're happening because you have a corrupt government. A corrupt government that doesn't have enough restraint telling it it cannot get involved in the economy like this. 
Next up, Madeline says monopolies are on the rise, and that's thanks to late-stage capitalism. No, they aren't. This is some Lena Khan elizabeth Warren derangement syndrome. Again, let's go to dictionary.com to look up the word that they're trying to use because they don't think they have. A monopoly means the exclusive possession or control of the supply of a trade and a commodity or service. Here's what I think is so interesting about people who talk about monopolies. They can't even identify one. Even in all of their biggest fear-mongering think pieces, they cannot point to a single monopoly in existence. Here's one example with the Open Markets Institute. They say, consider retail. Today, a single corporation, Walmart, controls 72% of warehouse clubs and super centers in the entire United States. 72% is not 100%. That's not a monopoly. In close to 40 metropolitan areas across America, Walmart sells more than half of all groceries. That doesn't mean that only Walmart is available in half of all rural areas. It means that rural people are choosing Walmart because they bring them cheap groceries. Cheap groceries in rural areas is a function of capitalism. It is eliminating hunger and poverty, and yet these people are mad at it. It makes absolutely no sense. It's just because of greed. They are so mad that somebody out there is getting wealthy that they don't even care about the good that they're doing to earn that wealth. They go on to bemoan that Amazon, the corporation, sells 74% of all ebooks and 64% of all print books sold online. Again, not a monopoly. Not only is it not a monopoly, meaning that they would be the only place you could get books online, it's not even earning a monopoly of sales. 74% of people are choosing to use them because they're getting good deals there. If somebody else was offering a better one, people would go there. Being successful in a market is not proof that you are a monopoly or that anything bad is happening. It just means that you're doing a good job at offering a product or service consumers want and are choosing. Yet these people stay mad when a company gets popular. In truth, the only real monopolies in the entire United States are the ones that the government has created and continues to back. Things like policing the public school system, and certificate of need laws that basically say a large hospital association can control who gets to come into a given market and compete with them. These are all institutions and public policies that capitalists oppose and actually show up to work against. Maybe you should join us if you're upset about them. And these are the only monopolies, by the way, out there that are actually hurting people. They're not monopolies because they are popular or they're just offering such a great product people are choosing to use it. They're monopolies because the government has prevented them from having competition or people from having a choice to pick something else. Lastly, Madeline says that people are not saving for retirement and that's because of late stage capitalism. In reality, people are not saving for retirement because they're irresponsible. It's not capitalism's job to save for you. It's your job to utilize capitalism, work hard, make money, provide for yourself, and save and plan for your future. And there are ample opportunities for you to do that in the United States. I think it's actually pathetic when people who are born here pretend that they can't figure it out. Meanwhile, people who are not born here, who have to risk their lives to come here, don't often have paperwork, don't speak the language, they can figure it out, but you can't? Give me a break. I did a whole recent episode on the problems with Social Security and retirement. And in large part, the reason Americans are not doing their due diligence and planning ahead is because they think the government's going to come in and save them, which is absolutely not going to on this issue. Because it is government run and actually lacks market incentives, Social Security is going broke. And it was also really never intended to float you all that long to begin with, as I detail in my other episode. Not to mention the returns that you get from these government accounts and Social Security pale in comparison to those you would get in a private actual market account under capitalism. So if anything, the government has impeded the ability for Americans to save for retirement while capitalism offers better options. You can criticize capitalism if you want to, but at least get your facts straight because when you do this kind of thing, it really just looks uninformed and manipulative at best. The reality is we do have many problems in the United States, but they are problems that are being created by the government intervening in the market not by the market itself. The late stage capitalism these people complain about is really just late stage the American experiment where the government has gone off the rails. And because of that, we are actually becoming less and less capitalistic by the day. All right, guys, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, leave me a like and a comment, and I'll see you next week. If you like this episode, don't forget to check out others in my series, Hannah Explains It All Here, and you can check out my other weekly show, Histrionics, here.